الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تولوا فقل حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل على سيدنا نبينا محمد يوم بعد وسلم My dear respected brothers and elders in deen With the fadl of Allah Azza wa Jal We have been learning with regards to the blessed life of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr in Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. Most of the ulama, the Salafi Salihin, the historians that have written about the blessed life of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr in Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, they have followed this theme and this tartib where initially they speak of his lineage, his personality, and they speak of his qualities. And thereafter, they speak regarding Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an's blessed life from the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And there is a reason for this. And the reason we have already explained many a times before that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an is the most unique and exclusive person in this ummah. That when you want to see the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, you can see the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wherever Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an who was with him, Whatever Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was experiencing, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was his companion. 
So the seerah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the seerah. The life of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So for this reason, the scholars have followed this tartib and this sequence where they speak of his lineage, then his qualities. And this is what we have been doing. For a prolonged period of time, we have just been learning about the qualities of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and so many of them Shah Waliullah Muhaddith Dahlawi rahimahullah whose works we have been sharing with you Izalatul Khifa and Khilafatul Khulafa the Shah Waliullah Muhaddith Dahlawi rahimahullah also follows the same sequence we have discussed many qualities of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala we will discuss a final few qualities that doesn't mean that we've reached the end of the qualities of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. It means that this is what Shah Waliullah Muhaddith Dahlawi rahimahullah sufficed upon. And we will start discussing the remainder life of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, which is only a few months over two years Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam his khilafa his rule was just over two years but what a ruler he was what a person he was and he became the person who he was because of the qualities that Allah had bestowed him with the qualities that he absorbed from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He strengthened, he fortified with the blessed company of Nabi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Ek taweel arse se hum Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ki paakiza zindagi ke baare mein seekh rahe. Jitne bhi muarrikhin hai, ulamae seer hai, جنہوں نے حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کی پاکیزہ زندگی کے بارے میں لکھا ہے جن میں شاہ ولی اللہ محدث دہلوی بہت بڑے انسان ہے علمی دنیا میں شاہ ولی اللہ محدث دہلوی بہت بڑے انسان ہے حضرت مولانا قاسم نانوتوی رحمت اللہ علیہ کا نام سنا ہوگا حضرت مولانا قاسم نانوتوی رحمت اللہ علیہ بہت بڑے ہیں لیکن ان کے بھی امام ہے شاہ ولی اللہ محدیث دہلوی شیخ الہند رحمت اللہ علیہ کا نام سنا ہوگا شیخ الہند رحمت اللہ علیہ کے بھی امام ہے شاہ ولی اللہ محدیث دہلوی کوئی معمولی شخصیت نہیں ہے بہت بڑے آدمی گزرے ہیں انہوں نے بھی حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کی پاکیزہ زندگی بیان فرمائی ہے اپنی اس کتاب میں اسی ترتیب سے کہ پہلے خاندانی سلسلے کے اعتبار سے ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کون تھے اور ہم سب جانتے ہیں کہ قریش کے تھے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے کچھ پشتوں کے بعد رشتدار بھی ہیں اور پھر اللہ تعالیٰ نے ان کو کون سی صفات سے نوازا تھا ان کی صفات کون سی تھی ترتیب وار اس کو بیان فرمایا اور صفات کے اختتام پر اللہ کے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے وصال سے بات شروع ہوتی ہے تو سوال یہ ہے کہ اللہ کے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی عمر اور حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کی عمر میں دو سال کا فرق ہے آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم عمر میں دو سال بڑے ہیں حضرت ابو بکر صدیق دو سال چھوٹے ہیں تو حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کی زندگی جب بیان ہوتی ہے تو آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے وصال سے معاملہ شروع ہو رہا ہے اس کا جواب یہی ہے کہ پوری زندگی نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی معیت میں گزار دی اور وہ صحبت اور معیت اس میں ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ عنہ ممتاز ہیں یہ مقام یہ شرف ان کے علاوہ کسی اور کو حاصل نہیں ہے صرف ان کو یہ حق حاصل ہے صرف ان کو یہ شرف حاصل ہے اس لیے حضرت ابو بکر صدیق کی زندگی بیان کی جاتی ہے تو آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے وصال سے تو شاہ ولی اللہ محدث دہلوی نے بھی اور دوسرے بہت سارے علماء سیر نے 
حضرت بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کے صفات بیان فرمائے ہیں جو ہم سنتے چلے آئے ہیں انہی مجالس میں کچھ چیزیں رہ گئی ہے صفات میں سے پھر حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ کی خلافت کا دور شروع ہوگا So we're looking at the last few qualities that Shah Waliullah has mentioned and thereafter we will look at the time and the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an as the first khalifa of this ummah as the representative of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ulama they explain the fear of Allah that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an held in his bosom he feared Allah so much. He was once sat and he saw a bird come sat in front of him. The bird came and it perched on a tree. And it pecked away on the tree and then flew away. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu and turns towards the bird's direction and he says, Wallahi, by Allah, only if I was like you. I wish to take your place. You came, you perched, you pecked and you left. You fear no reckoning on the day of judgment. You fear no hisab kitab. You fear no questioning. You fear no accounting. You have no account to settle with Allah. You are so free only if I were you. Once Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, he says, only if I was this tree, that a camel walks past the tree, the camel will stop at the tree. If only I was the leaves of that tree, some camel or beast would eat me, I would go down the throat of this animal, end up into its stomach, and after some time, I would become the feces of this animal, and my story ends. There's no questioning, there's no accountability. Only if I were the leaves of a tree. The ulama explained, look at his fear of Allah. His position, his rank, his honor, his status in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. He is so high and so senior that they say after the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam is Abu Bakr Siddiq and you've learned that Allah has given Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an the qualities that he gives to the Anbiya alayhi salam the prophets not to that same level of a lower level but the same qualities he possessed Allah has guided him Allah has protected him but yet look at the fear of Allah in his heart only if I was a bird he fears accountability on the day of judgment he fears the questioning of Allah. He fears everything that displeases Allah. He wants to engage in everything that pleases Allah. And this can be seen throughout his khilafah. And this is something that you will learn by the end of the majlis, inshaAllah. Shah Waliullah farmate ke Allah ta'ala ne Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ko اپنی خشیت اور اپنا خوف اتنا عنایت فرمایا تھا کہ حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ نے ایک پرندے کو دیکھا کہ وہ پرندہ اڑتا ہوا آیا اور ایک درخت پر بیٹھ گیا اور درخت پر کوئی چیز تھی جس کو اس پرندے نے چونچے ماری اور پھر وہاں سے اڑ کر چلا گیا اس پرندے کو دیکھ کر حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ نے فرمایا کہ کاش کہ میں تیری جگہ پر ہوتا کاش کہ میں ابو بکر صدیق نہ ہوتا کاش کہ میں بھی ایک پرندہ ہوتا کہ میں بھی تیری طرح آزادی کے ساتھ درخ پر بیٹھ کر کے چونچ مار کر کے میری غزہ لے کر کے پھر میں چلا جاتا اور مجھے اللہ تعالیٰ سے کوئی سوال جواب ہونے کا ڈر نہ ہوتا اللہ کے سامنے پیش ہونے کا کوئی خوف نہ ہوتا میدان محشر کے میزان کا مجھے کوئی خوف نہ ہوتا بس آوقات فرماتے کہ کاش کہ میں کسی درخت کا پتہ ہوتا کہ پتے کی حیثیت سے میں درخت پر ہوں اور کوئی چلنے پھرنے والا اونٹ آ کر کے مجھے چبا لے اور میں اس اونٹ کی حلق میں نیچے اس کے پیٹ میں اتر آؤں 
اور ایک عرصے کے بعد میں اس کی مہنگنی بن جاؤں میں اس کا پاخانہ بن جاؤں مجھے یہ زیادہ پسند ہے کیونکہ اونٹنی کے پاخانہ کو اونٹنی کی مہنگنیوں کو اللہ کے یہاں کوئی حساب کتاب نہیں ہے یہ ڈر تھا یہ خوف تھا جو اللہ نے عنایت فرمایا تھا اور اسی کے مطابق اپنی زندگی بسر فرمائی ہے خلافت سے پہلے بھی آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی معیت اور صحبت میں رہتے ہوئے اپنی زندگی کو پختہ بنایا اور خلافت کے بعد بھی حرف حرف میں لفظ لفظ میں بول بول میں اللہ کا خوف اللہ کی خشیت اللہ کا ڈر بالکل روز روشن کی طرح سامنے آتا ہے یہ ہے حضرت ابو بکر صدیق ونس نبی صلی اللہ تعالی علیہ وسلم منشن حدیث which many of us have heard that any person who lowers his garment beyond his ankles then on the day of judgment Allah Ta'ala will not look towards him which means that he will be deprived of the mercy of Allah Allah will not forgive him Allah will not show mercy on him because he out of his arrogance and stubbornness decides to and has chosen to neglect the command of Allah and his Rasul so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shared this with the sahaba Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq was present Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says O Prophet of Allah my lower garment I try my best to keep it above my ankles but at times it goes below my ankle Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says O Abu Bakr you are not from amongst those people because I guarantee that you are not doing it out of pride and stubbornness you are trying your best it is because of a problem that you have in your physique and for this reason your garment is going below your ankle again the fear of Allah Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that a person will be deprived of Allah's mercy and the first thing that crosses his mind Am I going to be amongst those people that will be deprived of Allah's love and mercy on that day of judgment? How can I save myself? How can I protect myself? And immediately he explains himself and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that you don't need to explain yourself. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam vouches for Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. He gives guarantee that oh Abu Bakr you don't have pride and haughtiness in you and you are not doing this out of pride. تخنوں کے نیچے کپڑے پہننے سے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی حدیث ہیں کہ جو کپڑے کو لٹکائے گا میدان محشر میں اللہ تعالیٰ اس پر نظر نہیں فرمائیں گے مطلب کیا ہے کہ میدان محشر میں وہ اللہ کی رحمت سے اور اللہ کی مغفرت سے محروم کر دیا جائے گا وہ جہنم میں پھینک دیا جائے گا حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ نے فوراً اللہ کے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم سے فرمایا کہ اللہ کے رسول میں تو کوشش یہی کرتا ہوں کہ میرے تخنے کے نیچے میری ازار نہ لٹکے لیکن میری کوشش کے باوجود میری ازار کبھی تخنوں سے نیچے پہنچ جاتی ہے آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے فرمایا ابو بکر آپ ان لوگوں میں سے نہیں ہیں آپ تکبر سے پاک ہیں اس کی گیرنٹی میں دے رہا ہوں آپ کے اندر یہ زد یہ اناد نہیں ہے اس کی گیرنٹی میں دے رہا ہوں یہ ہے ابو بکر صدیق اتنا اونچا مقام اللہ سے اتنے قریب لیکن پھر بھی اللہ کا ڈر اللہ کی خشیت اللہ کا خوف and us whenever we hear of something where unfortunately we are involved in the first thing we opt to do is try and look for a justification try and look for an excuse immediately we're on the internet looking for a scholar who says something else or looking for a scholar who opposes that particular view so that we can justify ourselves so that we can make ourselves feel better but on the day of judgment no statement from any scholar will help anyone even those scholars and all scholars will be drowning in their own perspiration and in their own sweat because they will also be held accountable and their accountability will be superior, more severe than the normal people. This is us. And look at Abu Bakr Siddiq. Because of a physical ailment, 
Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, whose waist did not allow his izar, his bottom garment, to stay above his ankle. And he is seeking the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he is asking Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Prophet of Allah, what can I do? And us, this is the difference. We say we love Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and we should. But then we need to emulate. This is what our deen says. Whenever we hear a discourse about our deen, and unfortunately we find that problem within ourselves, firstly we should be grateful to Allah, that oh Allah you have given me this opportunity to make amends. Allah you have given me this opportunity to do it differently. Allah you have given me this opportunity to seek forgiveness for what I have done wrong. And now I will make amends. I will correct it. I will improve it. I will do it better. This is what is expected from the servants of Allah. This is what is expected from the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why the Quran and the Sunnah is the guidance. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, For as long as you hold firm onto these two things, you will never go astray. And nobody will be able to ever harm you. No sooner that you move away from the Quran and Sunnah, then you will lose your value in the eyes of people. And this is what we see around the world today. Everybody is abusing Islam and Muslims. They wish to say as they please. They are doing with the Muslim as they please. Complete disregard. Why? This is the reason. We stepped away from the Quran and Sunnah. If we held the Quran in one hand and the Sunnah in the other, and our behavior, attitude towards our deen was like Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu an, then no harm would come to this Ummah. Look at the history of this Ummah. The Sahaba and the Tabi'een, they are the best of this Ummah. They are the strongest of this Ummah. They were the most influential of this Ummah. They were the most knowledgeable and learned of this Ummah. They ruled two-thirds of the world. Not because they had atomic weapons. Not because they had huge armies. Not because they had mastered the art of warfare. Because they stood firm with the Quran and Sunnah. When they were away from the battlefield, it was deen, deen and deen. And when it came to the battlefield, it was jihad. They knew our responsibility is to stand in the medan, in the field of jihad. It's Allah's duty and responsibility to assist us and we will conquer. We will be victorious. They didn't have to be concerned about anything else. Why? Because their lives were full of the Quran and Sunnah. Again, look, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. Such fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was parting this dunya, he said that please instruct Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu to lead the salah. But the people knew one thing about Abu Bakr Siddiq. Rajulun bakka. He's a person when he recites the Quran, he cries profusely. So they said, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an cannot lead the salah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said this three times. And each time his wife said the same thing. That he will not manage, he cries too much. To the extent Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa got angry and he said, You my wives are like the women of Yusuf alayhi salam. The women that cut their fingers. When I have instructed you, tell Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an to lead the salah, that is sufficient. Why are you keep telling me the same thing? That he is rajulun bakka. He cries too much. He cries profusely. He will not be able to lead the sahaba in salah. Do as I say. Don't behave like the women of Yusuf alayhi salam. This was a known fact. The sahaba they knew. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, due to his intense knowledge, due to his intense closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
due to his piety, due to his knowledge, the foresight that Allah has given him. He sees what everybody else does not see. He hears what everybody else does not hear. He thinks what everybody else does not think. So that makes him cry and weep. But when he became Imam, Surah Al-Baqarah, entire Surah Al-Baqarah in one Salah. Two and a half Jews of the Quran in one Salah. And on top of it, he is Rajulun Bakka. This was the khawf. This was the fear that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu had. And this is what made him who he was. He didn't go to no military school. He didn't go to no special school. He didn't have no special teachers. He had the best of all teachers, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who worked on his heart, his sifat. Today we need to learn the same. Sifat, the qualities. Work on the qualities that Allah has given us. Strengthen and fortify these qualities and it will be, make you a person that you never knew you were. And how he followed the instruction of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh would be on his camel and sometimes he would drop his whip from his hand. As we all know, when a camel sits and when the camel stands up, it makes a lot of movement. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, he would have his whip in his hand. And you've got to remember he's over 60 years old now. So at times his whip will fall from his hand. And he would make the camel sit again. He would come off the camel and pick the whip up with his hand. The Sahaba would say, Ya Khalifa ta Rasulillah. O Khalifa of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why don't you tell us? We'll give it to you. So you don't have to come off the camel. He said, my beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed me that never ever ask of the people. Haath mein chabuk rahti thi aur ootni par sawar hai. Ootni ki harkat se chabuk gir jati thi. Saat saal se upar ki umar mubarak ho chuki hai. Lekin ootni ko bithate hai. Aur phir khud ootni se tashrif laate hai. اور چابک زمین سے اٹھاتے صحابہ یہ فرماتے ہیں اللہ کے رسول کے خلیفہ اب ہمیں حکم فرما دیتے ہم آپ کے ہاتھ میں چابک واپس رکھ دیتے اتنی تکلیف آپ کر رہے ہیں فرما نہیں میرے محبوب نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے مجھ سے فرمایا تھا کہ کبھی لوگوں سے سوال نہ کرنا اتنی اطاعت اتنی اطاعت اللہ کے رسول کی this is the value of the instruction of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the eyes of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh and the Sahaba. That it was a simple thing. The Sahaba would have seen it as a favor, as an honor to pick up the whip and replace it into the hands of Abu Bakr Siddiq. But because of the instruction of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, he refused and he said, my beloved instructed me not to do so. This is where Shah Waliullah Muhaddith Dahlawi Rahimahullah, he stops discussing the qualities of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. And we have done it for hours, for many, many gatherings. Now he starts discussing the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an beyond and after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we start discussing the final moments of Nabi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we know, during the 10th year of Hijri, it was the first and only Hajj Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed. He went for Hajj. Whilst he was in Hajj, over 100,000 Sahaba were with him. And he imparted to the Sahaba the sermon that we all know of. The sermon of Arafat, known as the farewell sermon, Khutbatul Wada. It was in this sermon that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed the Sahaba as his ummah. He gave them clear instruction. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa returned from Hajj, this khutbah was a sign that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa will depart very, very soon. He returned to Medina Munawwara towards the end of Dhul Hijjah. As we know, Dhul Hijjah is the month of Hajj. He returned towards the end of the 10th year of Hijri, Dhul Hijjah. And in Medina Munawwara, once he returned, the Sahaba said that we learned that in the last few months of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's existence in this dunya, firstly, he started to visit the martyrs of Uhud. He would visit the graves of the martyrs of Uhud and he would make dua for the martyrs of Uhud. And another thing that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam extraordinarily instructed the Sahaba one was after the revelation of the verses he instructed that the Sahaba that it is not permissible for the polytheists the mushrikeen to reside in Al-Hijaz the Arabian Peninsula so he instructed the expulsion the exclusion of the mushrikeen from Al-Hijaz then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahaba, he warned the Sahaba, do not turn graves into masajid. Do not pl turn places of burial into places of worship. The places of burial are not places of worship. Allah ke Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sandas hijri mein haj ke liye tashreef le gaye. یہ آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی زندگی کا پہلا اور آخری حج ہے ایک ہی حج فرمایا اور اس حج کے سفر میں عرفات کے میدان میں اللہ کے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے عجیب اور غریب خطبہ دیا جو آج تک امت میں مشہور ہے اس خطبے کا نام ہے خطبت الوداع جدائیگی کا خطبہ پوری امت کو سامنے رکھتے ہوئے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے امت کو نصیحت فرمائی امت کی رہنمائی فرمائی لیکن اس میں اشارہ تھا کہ اب رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم زیادہ دیر تک صحابہ کے درمیان اور اس دنیا پر رہنے والے نہیں ہیں چنانچہ ذلحجہ کے مہینے کے اخیر میں مدینہ منورہ تشریف لائے مدینہ پہنچ کر صحابہ فرماتے ہیں کہ آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے تین انوخے کام کیے سب سے پہلا تو یہ کہ جو احد کے شہدہ ہے احد کی لڑائی میں جنگ احد میں جو صحابہ شہید ہوئے تھے آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ان کی قبر پر تشریف لے جا رہے ہیں اور دعائیں مغفرت فرما رہے ہیں دوسرا کام یہ فرمایا کہ حجاز میں سے سب مشرقین کو نکالنے کا حکم فرمایا کہ حجاز مقدس میں کوئی مشرق نہ رہے حجاز مقدس میں کوئی مشرک نہ رہے افسوس کی بات یہ ہے کہ اب حجاز مقدس میں مشرکین قدم رکھنا شروع ہو گئے ہیں it is unfortunate that نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کلینز الحجاز from the polytheists now unfortunately we are seeing that the polytheists are being invited and they are entering the blessed cities of Allah and his رسول صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم they are visiting مدینہ منورہ right to the doors of the masjid those places that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cleanse of the mushrikeen Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ne yeh farmaya tha ke hijaz mein se mushrikeen ko nikalo haramain se mushrikeen ko nikalna nahi farmaya tha kya farmaya tha hijaz se to haramain se nikalna to badar jaula hai yeh to masjidhe hai puri dunia ki sab se mukaddas jaga hai مکہ شریف کا حرم ایک نماز ایک لاکھ نمازوں کے برابر تو وہاں ہم مشرق کیسے برداشت کر سکتے ہیں مدینہ شریف ایک نماز پچاس ہزار نمازوں کا ثواب تو وہاں ہم مشرق کو کیسے برداشت کر سکتے ہیں but unfortunately this is what we need to learn these developments around the world these are very important developments these developments coincide with what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa has foretold us that this will happen this will happen this will happen do you know of the hadith when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said 
الاسلام يعود غريبا كما بدا غريبا Islam will return to become a strange way of life just how it started as a strange way of life when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam first invited the people towards islam they found it strange what is he saying why are they living like this it's going to happen you know the hadith when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says like how a snake comes out from the hole in the ground and returns to its hole islam will also come out and return back to Medina Munawwara so these are all important developments and these are important developments because Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has foretold this and when Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has foretold this it means that this ummah will stoop so low this ummah will stoop so low when the ummah will do things like this they will become worthy of the wrath of Allah the punishment of Allah the seeds of anarchy are showing its faces now north south east and west if you look at the world as a room there is gas being leaked from all four directions it will take one spark and that one spark will create a massive explosion and we are being geared towards this and when that will happen money will lose its value properties will lose its value suddenly in the last few years a lot of property has been made available to purchase certain groups have started to sell huge properties which they felt were the coolness of their eyes but suddenly they've started to sell movements and ripples are taking place in and around the world it is that one spark when that spark happens the currency in your pocket the value of your home the value of your car everything materialistic that is in front of you will lose lose its value completely and this is the anarchy that nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about Hence if you look at these people the sahaba their focus wasn't on materialistic wealth something you will learn further today if we get the time inshallah ul aziz but since we're on the subject I'll tell you when hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was khalif there was a small building in his area where he lived and that was the treasury so in our terms that's like the bank of england the treasury and he had no security so the sahaba they objected oh abu bakr siddiq there's no security place security in front of the treasury it needs to be protected hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu said protected for what from what open the doors of the treasury in the treasury there was nothing nothing because abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala and was the rightful khalif he had the fear of allah anything that was in the treasury is waste it should be in the hands of the people that deserve it in the treasury it is useless it is good and beneficial in the hands of the people that need it so then he explained i have no security at the treasury because i have left nothing in the treasury whatever comes into the treasury it is placed in the hands of the needy and those that require it so i have no need for security look at the difference the focus the attention so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he returned he said three things he visited the martyrs of uhud he said don't turn graves into places of worship and exclude the disbelievers the polytheists the mushrikeen from al hijaz and it happened al hijaz was made pak pure from shirk and from mushrikun that was a sign that allah azza wa jalla will call him that was the sign that we sent you to the hijaz now the hijaz is pure there's no more mushrikeen left you need to come back to us so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam got ill 
Dhul Hijjah, he came, Muharram, Safar. Two months, he became sick. And the sickness started to increase. It increased, and it increased. To the extent, in Rabi Awwal, during the last seven days, or the last 17 days of his blessed life, he became very, very weak. So he said to the Sahaba, call Abu Bakr Siddiq so that he may lead my Sahaba in Salah. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an was reluctant. And these are all a hadith from Bukhari Sharif, Muslim Sharif, very authentic. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an led the Sahaba in Salah. Then once Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa asked Hazrat Abbas, his uncle, and Hazrat Ali radiallahu an, his cousin, to take him to the masjid. So he rested his blessed arms on these blessed soul shoulders and his blessed feet were dragging along the ground. And they took Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the front from where Abu Bakr Siddiq was leading the salah. As Abu Bakr Siddiq tried to move back, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, stay. Carry on doing what you're doing. This is where there is a difference of opinion within the scholars. Some scholars say that when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh became a muqtadi instead of an imam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued his salah. Hazrat Abu Bakr became muqtadi and Hazrat Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became imam. Other scholars say no. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed Abu Bakr Siddiq, you carry on. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam completed his salah as the muqtadi, the follower of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. So Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala who carried on this way. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's weakness increased. Once, one morning Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of Fajr Salah, he removed the curtain from his blessed home. He looked at the Sahaba and the Sahaba saw him. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very radiant. A, a massive smile on his face. The Sahaba could see that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is looking very satisfied. And very pleased. He became pleased because he saw his Sahaba in the masjid. He saw his Sahaba in Salah. That pleased him. The Sahaba, when they saw Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they felt that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been cured from his, the radiance on his blessed face, the happiness, the smile on his face. And then he closed the curtain. Even Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was told that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to see and he smiled and he showed his pleasure. So Abu Bakr Siddiq felt that now my beloved has been cured. So he came and he said, O Prophet of Allah, I'm going to my wife's house and I will return shortly. And he went. The other sahaba felt that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been cured. But Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha saw that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is getting weaker and weaker. She placed the blessed head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on her blessed chest. And this is in the courtyard of Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala in his house. <coughs> Hazrat Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu walked in, who is the brother of Hazrat Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. And he had a siwak in his hand, miswak. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was looking at this siwak and miswak. So Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet of Allah, shall I take the miswak? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nodded. So she took the miswak of her brother. She chewed it and she did the miswak for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for, a, for some water in a bowl. And then he would place his hand in the bowl. And he would place his blessed hand over his own forehead. And he would say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, the pangs of death are indeed severe. The pangs of death are indeed severe. <coughs> he carried on doing the same. And he said, Allahumma ila rafiqil a'la. Allahumma 
إلى رفيق الأعلى اللهم إلى رفيق الأعلى and then he breathed his last before this he spoke to the Sahaba and he said there is a person Allah has given him a choice either he remains where he is or he spends the rest of his time with his beloved and the person has chosen to spend the rest of his time with his beloved the Sahaba thought that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling them a story an anecdote an example Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu started to cry profusely this is what the Sahaba say that none of us understood Abu Bakr understood immediately that is why he was the greatest alim amongst the jamaat of the Sahaba. The most knowledgeable alim. The person with the greatest knowledge was Abu Bakr Siddiq. He saw what we did not see. He heard what we did not hear. He thought what we did not think. That made him better than the rest. Anyway, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he breathed his last Allah had said in the Quran, Innaka mayyit wa innahum mayyitun. That, O Muhammad, وسلم, you will taste death, and so shall they taste of death. When this calamity hit the Sahaba, we all know there was pandemonium. Hazrat Umar said that he has gone to speak to Allah like Musa, السلام, he shall return. Hazrat Uthman lost his speech, could not speak. Hazrat Ali disappeared from the scene, could not be found. Sahaba falling to the ground, unconscious. Hazrat Anas radiallahu anhu says, the day Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, it was the most wonderful and radiant day in Medina. And a radiance that Medina had never seen. And the day Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam departed this world, it was the darkest day that Medina had ever seen. Hazrat Abu Bakr heard that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has left. So he quickly came. He walked past the masjid. Hazrat Umar has a sword in his hand and he's making these statements. He sees the Sahaba situation. But he comes into the house of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. He sees that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is placed with a garment covering his blessed body. He walked towards the beautiful blessed body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He removed the blanket from the blessed face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he kissed the blessed forehead of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, May my mother and my father be sacrificed to you, O my beloved. Allah will only make you taste death the ones that you already have. Allah will not make you taste death twice. He said this because of what Hazrat Umar was saying. <coughs> Hazrat Umar was saying that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has passed away, so he's gone to speak to Allah and he's going to come back. So if Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes back, he has to taste death again. Because inna kamayyit wa innahum mayyitun. So Abu Bakr said, no, once, and this is it, no more, final. Allah has <coughs> put you through this difficulty. And this is the only time you will never ever see or feel death again. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Breathing his last, Hazrat Fatima radiallahu anha said, Wa musibatah, O calamity. In Arabic, these words are used to express feeling. So she said, Wa musibatah, O my calamity. There is no greater calamity. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard this, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O my beloved, your father will never ever be distressed ever again. Your father will never ever be put in difficulty again. From this day onwards, your father will be content. Your father will be happy. So when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, he kissed his forehead, he replaced the blanket and he walked into the Masjid al-Nabawi. 
Hazrat Umar sword in his hand and he's still saying what he's saying. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says, sit down, O Umar. Umar sits down. Here Shah Waliullah Muhaddis Dahlawi Rahimahullah, he says something ajeeb. What the Sahaba said at the time, most of the Sahaba were Hafiz of the Quran. But they say it is as though we forgot this ayat of the Quran until Abu Bakr said this ayat. When he climbed onto the member and he said, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ Hazrat Umar himself radiallahu anh says that it was when Abu Bakr said this ayat that I sat down and I realized that this ayat was revealed by Allah. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anh who says we forgot this ayat existed. It was Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq when he recited it on the member that we realized that this ayat was revealed by Allah. So he calmed them down and we explained already and we've been through the speech of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. And he said to the Sahaba, Man kana minkum ya'budu Muhammada qad maata Muhammada Man kana ya'budu Allah fa inna Allah hayyun la yamut Those of you who worshipped Muhammad then Muhammad has passed away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam those who worshipped Allah, then Allah is forever alive and Allah will forever remain. It was these words that shook the Sahaba. Again, his composure. One of the other things that I forgot to mention that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did before his demise, a very important lesson. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prepared a huge army, a massive army. And he made the commander-in-chief of that army a sahabi by the name of Usama bin Zaid bin Haritha radiallahu ta'ala He was 18 years old. Hazrat Abu Bakr was in that army. Hazrat Umar was in that army. Hazrat Uthman was in that army. Senior sahaba were all in that army. It was prepared to go in the direction of Sham, Palestine. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prepared that army to be sent to Palestine, to Sham. And the commander-in-chief of that army was Usama bin Zaid, 18 years old, the son of a slave. Zaid bin Haritha was a freed slave. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prepared this army, some sahaba went to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst he was alive. And they said, O Prophet of Allah, we understand you're preparing this army but you're making Usama bin Zaid the commander-in-chief of this army. He's ill-experienced. He's inexperienced. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, When I made his father commander-in-chief, you complained then. Zaid bin Haritha. Where did he pass away? Where was he martyred? Jordan Muta. When I made him commander-in-chief, you had issues then. When you knew how I loved my Zaid, that is the same Zaid who at once was called Zaid bin Muhammad, Zaid bin Haritha. They started to call him Zaid bin Haritha only with the revelation of Allah's verses. He said, didn't you complain then? Even though you knew how beloved he is to me and he proved to you that he was worthy of that position. He is a martyr of Muta. Now you complain of the same with regards to his son, Usama bin Zaid. When you know how beloved he is to me, Usama bin Zaid is worthy of this position and he shall remain commander-in-chief. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always also prepared this army. Waiting to be dispatched and dispatched towards Palestine as Sham. But now this greatest calamity has taken place. It was Monday, the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, after Salatul Dhuhr, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left this dunya. There is ikhtilaf, difference of opinion 
in the exact date. But this is the most well-known call. This is the most preferred date and time according to the scholars. The 12th of Rabiul Awwal after Salat al-Dhuhr. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh spoke to the Sahaba. Then Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he left the Masjid al-Nabawi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba, they said, now we came to our senses. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, what he is saying makes sense. Most of us came to our senses. Now the Muhajirun, they moved into one direction. Those that had migrated from Makkah Mukarramah, known as the Muhajirun. And the Ansar, the people of Medina, they also moved together in another direction. So the Ansar, they gathered in a place known as Banu Sa'diyya. The Muhajirun were with Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq an, in another place. Hazrat Umar an, was with them. Now there is only one discussion. What happens after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This ummah cannot be left without a leader. There has to be a leader for this ummah. So the Muhajirun, they discussed amongst themselves that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has always said there are a hadith in Bukhari, Muslim and many, many books of hadith extremely authentic. Nobody can refute or argue the authenticity of these hadith where categorically Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the Khilafah of this Ummah must and should remain with the Quraysh. And there are reasons for it which we shall discuss. So the Muhajirun who are discussing themselves, the Ansar, they gathered around one person known as Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah, who was the leader of the Khazraj tribe, radiallahu an. And the Ansar were saying that these guests of ours, they came from Makkah. They were weak. They had nothing. We served them. We gave them. We protected them. They are who they are because of us. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved us because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if the people are traveling in, through a valley and the Ansar are traveling through a valley, I will go in, in the valley where the Ansar are traveling. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the Muhajirun, they are my dress and the Ansar wo mera they are my inner garment closest to me so the Ansar knew of their position and the love Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for them so they started to discuss that Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu an must now be made the Khalif on one side Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and Hazrat Umar and the Muhajirun, they said, what are we doing? We can't have this mashwara without the Ansar. We can't have these discussions without our brothers. Stop these discussions. Let's go to our brothers, the Ansar. Let's go to the Banu Sa'diyya. This place where these discussions took place, you will see now in the Masjid al-Nabawi courtyard. Where this discussion took place, Banu Sa'diyya. Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, and the Sahaba Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah, radiallahu an, the Ashara Mubashara, all moving in the direction of Banu Sa'diyya. Two people came from the Banu Sa'diyya and they met Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar. So they said, Where are you going? So we're going to see our Ansar brothers. We need to have a very important discussion. So these two brothers said, there is no discussion to have. They've already decided to make Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala an as the Amir, as the Khalif of this Ummah. <coughs> Even then, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and Hazrat Umar, they walked and they went to the Banu Sa'diyya. <coughs> when they went to the Banu Sa'diyya, this is what Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an who says. These are his words. Whilst going there, I was thinking and I had prepared a wonderful speech that I was going to deliver to calm the situation down so that everybody is on the same page so we can have the correct outcome and conclusion for the Ummah. So I was thinking, I was preparing, I was planning 
and I was walking towards the Banu Sa'diyya. When I went there, we saw our Ansar brothers, and there was somebody who was covered in a blanket in between them. So Hazrat Umar says, I asked them, Ye kaun hai? Who is this person and shrouded in a blanket? They said, This is Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah radiallahu an. So he said, Why is he enshrouded in a blanket? They said he is suffering from fever and he is unwell. That is why he has covered himself in a blanket. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala bohat ziyada barik bhi te. Har har cheez ko dekhte te aur samajhte te. To yehi sawal farmaya ke ye beech mein joh baitha hai chadar oor ke ye koon hai? Farmaya Saad bin Ubadah hai. Ye chadar oor ke kiyo baitha hai? Why is he making himself different from the others? اپنے آپ کو الگ کیوں بتا رہے ہیں ایسی چادر کیوں پہنی ہے تو فرمائیں کہ ان کو بخار ہے بیمار ہے اس لیے then حضرت ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ عنہ once he arrived حضرت عمر رضی اللہ عنہ he says that once everybody gathered I walked so that I can speak to the jamaat of the muhajir and the ansar I was about to speak and حضرت ابو بکر says خاموش quiet sit down عمر Hazrat Umar says that Abu Bakr Siddiq told me to be quiet. So I in silence sat down. And then Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an started to speak. Hazrat Umar says, Wallahi al-Azim, everything that I had planned, Hazrat Abu Bakr spoke that, but even better than how I could have delivered it. Because we all know Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu didn't engage in diplomacy. He was not a diplomat. In the vocabulary of Hazrat Umar, there was only two colors, either white or black. The color gray did not exist. And he was very strong in his words. But this was a moment that required some softness and some diplomacy. So Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu told Umar sit and then he spoke and the first thing he did he mentioned the qualities of the Ansar he mentioned how Allah had blessed them how Allah had favored them how they made Ihsan on the Muhajirun how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved them he praised them and he spoke of their qualities and he spoke of their contribution towards Islam. But then at the end he said, Sa'ad bin Ubadah, remember the person in the blanket? He said, Oh Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu anh, were you not present when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the reins of this ummah must be with the Quraysh? Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu anh, Sahabi, As-sahabatu kulluhum adul. Every sahabi, radiyallahu anh, has impeccable integrity. He said, yes, O Abu Bakr Siddiq, I heard Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that the reins of this ummat must be placed in the hands of the Quraysh. As soon as Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadha radiyallahu anh, who said this, there's no argument. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, claimed by Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiyallahu anh, confirmed by Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah, the most senior representative of the Ansar. Immediately, there was no further argument. Then, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that once we have come to agreement that the Khalif must be from the Quraysh, he said, where is Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu? So they said, here he is. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anh Aminu hadihi al-Ummah The most trustworthy of this Ummah Hazrat Abu Bakr says Take his hand And take the pledge of allegiance At the hands of Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah He is our Khalif Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah says Wait I'd rather have my head severed Than me given this responsibility I will not take this responsibility as soon as Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah says this, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu takes the blessed hand of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu 
and he says, I pledge at the hands of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Oh, my brothers, you also take pledge at the hands of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Hazrat Abu Bakr says that I had two names in my mind. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, number one. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, number two. Look at the ikhlas. Look at the fear of Allah. Hiding from position. Not wanting the position. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu is saying no. But Hazrat Umar is not taking his answer. He took his hand and he pledged allegiance. And then everybody there, the Muhajirun, Ansar, everybody took their pledge at the hands of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. But this was in Banu Sa'diyya, in the courtyard of the Banu Sa'diyya. The Banu Sa'diyya was like the town hall of the Ansar throughout their history that was their place where they would come together <coughs> so this was the place where Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an gave his speech and they made the pledge but now this pledge had to be made public this was on the 12th the following day Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an who came to the masjid and the hadith that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu referred to when he asked Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah radiallahu anhu that did you not hear this hadith from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Inna hadha al-amra fi Qurayshin la yu'adihim ahadun illa akbahahu allahu fi nari ala wajhi ma qam ad-deen that the responsibility of leadership of this ummah shall remain with the Quraysh any person who has animosity for the Quraysh, Allah will throw them headlong into the fire of Jahannam until and unless the Quraysh remain on the right path. Quraysh for leadership. And the condition? Remain on the right path. It was this hadith reported by Bukhari that Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala and who affirmed and confirmed, yes, and it was because of this hadith that there was consensus amongst the Sahaba. The next day, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, comes to the masjid. He sits on the member. He was refusing. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu kept asking him, kept asking him, pursuing him. Reluctantly, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu came on to the member. And before Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq spoke, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu spoke. And he spoke to the Sahaba and told the Sahaba that in this jama'at of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no better person than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And he spoke of the qualities and all of those areas when Hazrat Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was special, was exclusive. Then Hazrat Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to the Sahaba. He said, I have been given this responsibility not because I am better than you. I am not better than you. If any one of you wants to take my place, you are more than welcome. And I hand over my position. I resign. In today's words, I resign. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala who came forward, sword in one hand. He came towards the member. Everybody was thinking that Hazrat Ali radiallahu an wants Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu to resign. He placed one foot on the member, one foot on the ground, sword in one hand, and he says, O oh Abu Bakr as Siddiq, there is no other person worthy of this position than yourself. If you resign, we do not want your res resignation. If you resign, we will not accept your resignation. We accept you as the Khalif of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thereafter, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says, I have been given this responsibility not because I am better than you. As long as I am correct, follow me. If I go astray, correct me. In my eyes, your weak people are strong in my eyes. Your strong people are weak in my eyes. Any weak person 
whose rights are usurped, I will return his rights to him. Any strong person, wealthy person, who takes the rights of others, I will remove those rights from him and return them to the poor person. So as Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, in his very short and brief khutbah, firstly he said, I am not worthy of this position. I didn't ask for this position. You gave me this position. Me aya nahi hu, tum mujhe laye ho. I just gave a speech to the Ansar explaining to them what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said. I never wanted Khilafat. You made me Khalif. You brought me here. And I am not here because I am better than you. Whereas we all know, the Sahaba knew that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was better than them. But he says, I am here not because I am better than you. Then he says, where I am right, you support me. Where I am wrong, you correct me. And then he mentions insaf and justice in society. What is justice? Justice is to create an equilibrium. To create equality. And this equality is not the equality that the communists say. And it's not the equality that the capitalists say. Because these are both failed systems. These are both systems of shaitan. The communist system and the capitalist system. They are failed systems. And they are systems of shaitan and iblis. The system of equality and the system of justice is the Quran and Sunnah. Bas. Nothing else. The Quran and Sunnah. With the existence of the Quran and Sunnah, any capitalist or communi communist system becomes zero. This is why they are hell bent in ensuring that the world does not witness a system based on the Quran and Sunnah. No sooner this system comes into existence, capitalist systems, communist systems will become a thing of the past, will become the background. This is why Shaitan Iblis and his cronies are hell bent to ensure that the Quran and Sunnah do not take precedence. Muslim, how long has it been? <coughs> so as Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala accepted as the Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam one of the ideas that came from the Ansar that from amongst you Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah we will accept him from the Muhajirun as Khalif and Sa'ad bin Abi Ubada radiallahu anhu from the Ansar so we will have two Khalifs Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that you cannot put two swords into the same sheath ek mayan mein do talwaren nahi aa sakti ek mayan mein do talwaren nahi aa sakti you can't put two swords into the same sheath one amir one khalif one sheath that's how it will be that's how it can be there is no other system that will work but alhamdulillah, due to the hikmah of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, and his knowledge of hadith and the selflessness of Sa'ad bin Abi Ubadah radiallahu an, the Ansara backing him to become Amir, but he is saying no. The hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said that it can only be from the Quraysh. Now we need to understand why from the Quraysh. Does this mean in Islam there is a system based on color and creed? Nay. Why did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that the leadership must continue with the Quraysh? The reason for this is that the Arabs had already been united for centuries under the leadership of the Quraysh 
even before Islam. This is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made such a hard effort to get the leadership of the Quraysh to accept Islam. If the leadership of the Quraysh accepted Islam, for Islam to spread in the Arabian Peninsula would have become very easy. That's why his focus was the leadership. But they didn't follow, they didn't follow, they didn't accept, they made it difficult. So the Arabs already knew and they already respected the Quraysh. The Quraysh from amongst the Arabs had the purest of lineage. And they had this honor within the Arabs. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there is already this honor for the Quraysh. This respect for the Quraysh. And now the Quraysh are Muslim. They will not act like how they acted before in the days of Jahiliyyah. So this status quo must remain. So that the leadership of the Muslims can continue with the Quraysh. But only until and unless they stay on the teachings of Islam. Though sooner they move away from the teachings of Islam, then even the Quraysh are not worthy of Khilafah. Even the Quraysh are not worthy of Khilafah. You will hear many things maybe in college or university from people who will either openly say that they are Shia or they have tendencies of Shia or they have Shia beliefs but they don't realize they have Shia beliefs because they have read garbage they have researched material which is not authentic any narration that is put before you that there was a skirmish in the Banu Sa'diyya there was a difference of opinion and argument between Hazrat Umar radiallahu an and this person all of this is fabrication and it is fabrication with intent to confuse the Muslim Ummah to put within the Muslim Ummah opportunities where the Ummah start to criticize the Sahaba the creme de la creme as far as you and I are concerned we love the Sahaba and they are pure from any fault that anybody attributes to them because that is a door we do not need to enter from that will not benefit you and I in any way but if we say anything in opposition to the integrity of the Sahaba then we can be deprived of Iman the Shia group they became the Dalin they became misguided because of their arrogance because of their stubbornness and unfortunately because of their stupidity jahalat their ignorance because some of the things that they spew out when it comes to the khilafah of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an even a child will be able to say that this is incorrect this is not possible this cannot be right but it served certain purposes and for that reason it is put into the fore even now unfortunately many of our youngsters young men and young women in college and university sometimes they are challenged by lecturers and by teachers and by fellow students non-muslims and they use the shia narrative or sometimes you will find muslim so-called muslim colleagues they even pray with you in the prayer rooms and they will call themselves muslim and they will say i am sunni but he or she is a Sunni in Sunni garb, but from the inside they are something else. One golden rule. One golden rule. Anybody who criticizes any Sahabi, anybody who criticizes any Sahabi, we don't want to hear from him. Even if it's me here, if I criticize, may Allah protect us all any sahabi then i am worthy to be stoned to death don't ever listen to whatever i have to say throw me out put your fingers in your ears i have nothing good to say and nothing good to give this is the golden rule anybody who has the audacity
to criticize any Sahabi, that's the first sign, thank you, but I don't want to hear. Whether he is your lecturer, whether he is the father of your lecturer, whether he is a friend or somebody who calls himself to be your friend, no matter who they are, no sooner do they show their audacity by criticizing a Sahabi, then you know that I need to distance myself because very soon this person has the potential to snatch away my Iman. This is how dangerous they are. If you knew our history, if you knew Islamic history, the Europeans, when they marched towards Masjid Al-Aqsa, Crusaders, they were the Christian armies moving from west towards east. But there was another army moving from east towards west, making way for the Crusaders. Who were they? The Shias. These, this other army was working together with the Christian Crusaders. Every time, every time there has been detriment and harm caused to the Ummah since after the time of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, this sect has been instrumental. Those same people who object to the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhum. So this is the golden rule. Anybody who has the audacity to criticize any Sahabi, we don't listen to them. Any book that criticizes any Sahabi, burn it. Any scholar who criticizes the Sahaba, ignore them, move away from them. This is the golden rule. As long as we follow this rule, Allah will keep our Iman intact. We will love them, we will follow them, or we will learn about them unreservedly, unconditionally. Who's them? The Sahaba. That is the rule. As long as we follow this, inshallah, we will be safe. And we want to love them to that extent, we want to follow them to that extent, but Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ar-rajulu ma'aman ahab. That we are resurrected with them on the day of judgment. So their love will help us even on the day of judgment. May Allah ta'ala give us all that tawfiq. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.